there are approximately 1.2 billion Catholics in the world. But does the world recognize us as Catholics or even as Christians? Our guest says this is why we need the new evangelization. We'll talk about that tonight, so please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome on Father Mitch Paquin, and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. And our guest has come from a fair, pretty fair piece of distance. He is here to help us answer the question of how to evangelize a culture that has already heard the gospel in one form or another, but doesn't see the need to connect with God, and more to the point, doesn't recognize the absence of God as an absence in their lives. So please welcome the President of the Pontifical Council for Promoting the New Evangelization, Archbishop Rino Fisichella. Thank Archbishop, you. Thank you, welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Where are you from originally? Originally from Milan. Milan. A small, small village close to Milan in Lombardy, <laughs> okay. in Italy. Yeah. Okay. But I moved to Rome when I was 19. Mm -hmm. So all my life in Rome. Yes. The eternal city. Yes. Though I always like to remind the Romans their eternity only begins in the 8th century BC. This is fairly late. Yeah. I, I like to go back to the Bronze Age. Great, great. <laughs> history belongs to our history. Exactly, yeah? exactly. The um, work that you do now is as president of the Pontifical Commission on, or Council on New Evangelization. What uh, is this new evangelization? And this is obviously an important Vatican office, but what do we mean? by a new evangelization? Well, this is a big question because uh, what is the new evangelization? I would say, first of all, it's not just a beautiful expression yes. in which you can put everything uh, and the contrary of everything. No, absolutely not. New evangelization is uh, an expression that uh, John Paul II used the first time in a speech that uh, he did in, uh, in uh, Krakow, just close to Krakow, in uh, Nova Huta. We should go back in uh, uh, 1979, June 1979. Yes. In Nova Huta, the Pope coming from Poland and uh, back to his uh, former diocese, he celebrated uh, the Holy Eucharist, and then uh, he saw a cross, a very, very big cross close to uh, the, the church. And uh, like, like a, a real a prophetical insight, he said, uh, spontaneous, he said, my dear brothers and sisters, look that cross. This is the sign of the evangelization of our country. Well, starting from this cross, we should, we should take a new evangelization. And starting from this point, for 27 years, John Paul II spoke on new evangelization. That means new order, new methods, new language, so new enthusiasm to share with people 
our personal encounter with Christ. When, one of the interesting points of that being first stated in Nova Huta is that it was there that he fought with the communist government when he was bishop and archbishop to permit right. the building of that church. They had designed an industrial town that would be the new man, the new communist person who is without religion, superstition, and would just be oriented towards the economy and the state. And You're right, you remember very well. I've been there. <clears throat> and, and it was uh, very interesting that, you know, he said no. And the people said no. They didn't mind working there, but and God you know, was going to be the center. You know in which occasion? It was a very, very cold night of Christmas. Mm -hmm. That's right. The, the Archbishop, uh, Karol Wojtyła, said, well, if we don't have a church, we celebrate Mass in the street. And the government didn't. He said, well, but people won't. And he started to celebrate Mass, and it was thousands, thousands, and thousands of people that even police could not do anything against. In fact, just a few of the militia, the po local police, were making the sign of the cross. Oh, right. Because they were Catholics right. at their core. Right. He, and his new evangelization was to evoke faith in the midst of the attempt to eradicate it. I would say is uh, to evoke our history. It means to evoke what we are, because, you know, we are a country, Europe, North America, South America. I would say all the Western culture <laughs> is a culture, is a count, they are countries born from the Christian culture. Exactly. And that means for us to go back to our origins and to understand also who we are. In some way, I would like to say, when we speak about a new evangelization, we are speaking also about our own identity. And one word that is very important for us is identity, to understand who we are and to have a very strong identity. Because just when you have a strong identity, you can speak with, uh, with the others and you can also understand uh, the difference between you and the others. And you can be also able to share who you are and uh, the others. So the new evangelization is not just something that uh, we do as uh, uh, a part of our faith because uh, at the first, you know, at the first uh, there is uh, the command of Jesus, go everywhere, go to all the world and make disciples all the nations. So, and then you, sh you are called to baptize people who will believe in me and in your preaching. So we obey to, first of all, we obey to the command uh, of Jesus Christ. But then uh, we need also to know uh, who we are, our identity, our history, and our culture. Yeah. And see, in this, you know, y y your own area, Lombardy, in Italy, is called that because the Lombards were barbarians who invaded and wrought great destruction. But Pope Gregory the Great saw these are people we must evangelize. So that the barbaric background of the Lombards, the Goths and all the others is transformed and they become a new identity, no longer barbarian, but through Christianity, civilized. Absolutely. I, I would say we cannot forget, for instance, in our history, first of all, uh, Leo the Great, Pope Leo the Great, who was one of the first, but we cannot forget uh, Gregory the Great, and not forget that Gregory, Gregory, the Pope Gregory, 
was a Benedictine. And as a Benedictine, he sent all the monks around all Europe, and this was the moment in which Europe was really created as a, a, a unity of countries and the different traditions. And then, you, you know, I, I am smiling when uh, today I hear that uh, we are, uh, we are uh, uh, creating the Union, the European Union. But the European Union was made, made in, in eight and seven, seven, eight century already. And that was made by the evangelization. So that was made by the monks who, uh, uh, who, who brought in, in, in the different countries and in different traditions and in different religions also, they brought the gospel of Jesus Christ. The European Union is this human attempt to forget that history because in the Enlightenment, whether the French Revolution, Napoleonic Wars, nationalism of Bismarck and later, or the fascists in Spain, Italy, the Nazis, the communists, all these attempts destroyed that unity that faith had at one point started. And we are back to saying, no, your ideas don't work. Let's go back to Jesus. But you know, what you mentioned is very, is very important because it, uh, it means that we are in Europe, we are forgetting our identity. Yes. And this is, uh, this is a very, very dangerous trap that is in, uh, in, our, in our history for this particular moment. Because uh, to, uh, to forget what we are and our history, our identity, it means that there is no future for us. And how can we have a future forgetting the origin of our culture? And that comes from the gospel. So I think, for instance, I think what you mentioned in the beginning, we, we feel today as one of the main problems in Western culture that people don't perceive anymore the absence of God as an absence on their own life. And that means that there is no possibility at all to grow up as a, a human identity. Because uh, listen, when you put a God in a corner and when you marginalize God, you have no more the center of, uh, you are no more the center. You man and you woman, you are no more the center because the center will be someone else. The center will be, uh, will be the new discovery. The, the center will be the, the research of science. Uh, the center will be the technique and so everything that we know. But if we have no more relationship between human person and God, forget it, that uh, can be a future in our life. It's one of the ironies to me uh, to think back on how enlightenment and post-enlightenment ideology tries to portray religion as the big cause of war, whereas it was precisely their rejection of faith and the rejection of living out the faith that really brought the great wars, that the wars of Christianity account for 2.6 million people. The wars of secularism are 305 million people. So that, in, like you say, when they forget their origins, and not only forget, but try to stuff it back, try to reject, then they become more violent than their pre-Christian ancestors. Yeah. 
we should say that uh, some objections are also in part uh, two because uh, we cannot forget that in our history there is also some, uh, some uh, point in shadow. So I mean, mm -hmm. there is a division. Mm -hmm. And this kind of division, they put also some strong uh, element of violence, but that was the cause of forgetting what we should be and forgetting the, 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 prima, pri, the primacy of God in, in, in our life. So uh, probably the human interest and the politics interest, they had more, more power than, than religion. But I will say just, just this, this, this one uh, uh, think uh, as a consequence of that, that of course we have also our, our we had uh, different problems, but the problem of today is, uh, is, uh, is different because the problem of today is that our behavior is no more in relationship with God. Yes. And so, and we become judge of uh, all of our actions and we become judge of the good and the bad. And uh, if uh, we forget God in our life, who will be the true judge about our own life? Well, you, you see in part uh, in history that without God as the absolute arbiter of truth and goodness and beauty, that then the arbitrary notions that come and go are fads so that one group you think is good at a certain period is fine, but then it's easy to turn on them. And this is also part of that history. There's no way by which we can really examine and judge ourselves without God as the reference point who shows who and what is good and true and beautiful. Absolutely, I, 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 I agree. And I would say once you marginalize God and then you, man, you have no more the center of the situation, I would say more, the power will be taken by the most arrogant, the most powerful, right. and then you become all the time more and more weak in your life. You become, uh, as in the game of chess, you are a pawn right. for those who are powerful and no more. And if you're useless, they'll sacrifice you to promote themselves. Right. Yeah. For this reason, you know, we need also in, in, in this big cultural crisis in which we are, because we cannot forget that this is a very particular moment with a cultural crisis. So for this reason, new evangelization is for us a chance and a challenge. Mm -hmm. A chance because we should be able once again to discover the faith and to discover the revelation, the word of God given to us, but it is also a challenge for people to understand that, uh, once again, we should be able to take in a serious consideration our own life. I would say the meaning, the meaning of our life. Who am I? Yes. Who am I? Where I'm going? I would say there is, a, there is a, a life after this life. There is an eternal life which kind of meaning does have uh, the, the suffering? Why should I suffer? Why should I die? Why do I love? Because, so this is a big question. In a moment in which our culture is in a big crisis, especially with the main concept of our life, that is love. People don't understand anymore the true value of love. Mm -hmm. And they make a big confusion between uh, passion and love. 
we don't understand anymore that love is, is forever. And if it's not forever, cannot be love. Because you could not love a person just for a few years and then you change again. This is, this is not the true life, the true human life. You know. no, it's giving back to, to what we were saying before that I use people as pawns. I may feel a passion for them, but if I don't feel passion, they're out of my life. And, it, and that's not about love. That's about how they augment me, not how I give myself to them and receive them as they are. That's, they don't understand love. Uh, you know, probably, probably oh. because also we Christians, we don't do our best in order to share and to give also our witness on that, that the revelation of God is to love. Mm -hmm. We should be able also to share once again the necessity, the necessity of this experience is the experience of love. And to remember that God loves you and God is merciful with you. As you can see, this is the teaching of uh, the daily teaching of Pope Francis. Pope Francis from the beginning, the first uh, word that he said on the window of, of, uh, of the St. Peter's Square, it was, it was God is merciful. Mercy is the experience but that we should, uh, we should have uh, in uh, relation with God. But that means also to recognize that we are sinners, that we, there is a contradiction in our life. There is a limit. And for this reason, probably, we should be able to do the both, uh, the experience uh, as a sinner and especially the experience of the mercy of love, the pardon. Think about it. Can you see in this culture, within this culture, that was created by the evangelization of uh, 2,000 years of our history, there is still, a, uh, still uh, uh, the, 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 the culture of pardon, for instance, or there is a culture of rancor, of revenge, of vendetta. I mean, I mean, where, where can we see concrete signs of pardon in our culture? But probably this is what, what we need. This is probably what we should be able to, to witness to the world today. Well, see, it has struck me uh, in visiting Poland, in becoming familiar with St. Faustina Kowalska, that she died just a year before the Nazi invasion, and then followed by the communists. And this was something of a message of the mercy Christ wants to bestow on the world, precisely at a moment in history when people would be more merciless than they had ever been before. We never saw so violent and merciless a century as the 20th. And the, um, things don't look so well for the 21st. The, but that message of mercy coming from Jesus absolutely. You know, was absolutely appropriate. Absolutely, you know, uh, we cannot forget that the 20th century, the century of democracy, the century in which everything seems to us uh, the most important uh, moment for all the history, but the 20th century was the century of more than one million of martyrs that we had in the Catholic Church. Uh, actually, it's 45 million martyrs. Well, all to, uh, including non-Catholics. Well, you can see how how we uh, we we can uh, speak about uh, the history of the 20th century. Yeah. But it is interest, interesting, and uh, I like that you mention 
uh, Faustina Kolanska? Well, first of all, you know, because uh, I was born in the same day of uh, uh, the Faustina, the 25th of August. But this is another... But a is different my, year. Uh, a different year, of course. But this is just because it makes me uh, uh, so more enthusiastic when uh, I read uh, the journal of Faustina. But, you know, this is very, is very important. Uh, this is true. God gives to us signs in the different moments of our history and also our personal history. We receive, we receive signs from God. The question is, are we able to recognize it? Are we in the condition? Do we have eyes to recognize the presence of the Lord in our history and in our personal life? That, for me, is the problem. Yes. So we have all the time signs of mercy, signs of love, witnesses, people, men, women, young people, all those people. It doesn't matter. We have every day, every day, signs of the presence of, uh, of God's mercy and love. But are we able to recognize it? Mm -hmm. This is my question. And for this reason, I think that the new evangelization also is uh, an instrument, is a condition, is a possibility to know better your life, to catch, to be able to catch the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah, the Isaiah speaks in a way that's odd to us, but very appropriate. He talks about having fat on your heart and your ears that prevents you from being able to see and understand what God is doing. And, you know, and sometimes also the 20th century is fascinated with its own accomplishments, its increase of wealth and so many other, you know, luxuries that were unknown to hardly anyone, and yet fairly general in some civilizations, but it makes the heart and the, the ears fat from hearing. They can't hear what God is trying to say. And this is also, for some people, a problem. Do we let God break through our fascination with the baubles and shiny things and rich things of our culture? Yeah, sure. I will continue your reflection on uh, the prophet Isaiah when in the chapter 55 there is a beautiful expression because the prophet says, so speak uh, the Lord, my thoughts are not your thoughts and my ways are not your ways. So I will forget all of your sins they will be never, never again in my presence. So just to show that when we speak about God, when we speak of God, we are not speaking about something theoretical. We are speaking about an experience of him. So we are just trying in our own life, within our culture, we are just trying to understand what is is a present the way the way is showing to us to go out also from this big crisis and from this disease of of our culture because it is a disease you know we should we should be able to find the therapy and so we cannot just make a diagnostic of what we are in this uh, particular moment, in some way a crazy moment, but we should be also be able to, to have a diagnostic, so to give a therapy people to understand the right way of, uh, of salvation. So that when the, in other words, look for a way to clog, get the fat out of the arteries that clogs up the heart, heart valves. Oh, 
Uh, we're going to take a little break. Uh, we need to, to do that. But before we go to the break, I want to mention uh, Archbishop Fisichella's book, The New Evangelization, Responding to the Challenge of Indifference. It is available at EWTN's Religious Catalog. You can go there on the website by going to EWTNReligiousCatalog.com or you can call them to get a copy of his book. Uh, the number is 1-800-854-6316. And we'll be back in just a couple minutes to continue on with this uh, conversation with Archbishop Fisichella on the new evangelization. So please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. First of all, we'd like to invite you to come here to be part of our studio audience. If you can come and join us, please contact our pilgrimage department. The number is 205-271-2966 or you can go to the main uh, webpage, EWTN.com, where they can get you information on times uh, for masses, tours to the studio, and you know, uh, chance to be part of the studio audience, and of course get up to Hansville and see all the sisters. So uh, please do come if you get a chance. Now, Excellency, I want to get back to your book. Uh, I mentioned it right at the very end of the last segment, you know, talking about uh, this new evangelization um, and responding to the challenge of indifference. Um, you know, the church has responded to persecution by the Nazis, the French revolutionaries, the, the, the First Republic of France, uh, the, the communists certainly, um, and all kinds of groups through history and all, all that. But now it seems more in the West that there is indifference. It's no big deal. You know, leave us alone, and we'll basically leave you alone. Um, how do pastors and how do lay people respond to the indifference they see around them in regard to the faith? Well, you know, indifference, uh, it seems to be the mature fruit of the secularism coming from the beginning of the last century. Mm -hmm. and, then, uh, and then we have the consequences of that. Indifference is not just uh, in relation with faith, with God, with the gospel. Indifference is also in relation with uh, the other person that we encounter in our life because uh, one of the signs of the indifference is our individualism. We are closed, closed in ourselves, and uh, we don't feel any more responsible for the other. And you know, living in a society, if you don't feel responsible, if you think that uh, just indifference 
is your condition of life, you believe me, you will not go far away from that because there is no more society. There is no more family. There is just uh, yourself and no one else. And I think that this is not, this is not really human life and sense, uh, and sense of your life. I think that, uh, first of all, we pastor and uh, every bo everyone who is uh, uh, engaged in, uh, in new evangelization. But you know, in this case, new evangelization, it means also information, school, in uh, hospital, so ev everywhere there is, uh, there is people. At work. At work. Yeah, yeah, where, where you go on to the work. street, yeah. on the street, everywhere, everywhere there is people. There is, uh, there is people, should be also someone who is uh, able to say, I want to be responsible of you. And that means I want to be a response to you. I like to share with you my experience. And that is the same. So you can be teacher in a school, you can be mother, father in your family, you can be pastor, priest, bishop, religious, uh, uh, religious uh, person, uh, uh, everything, everything. And, and, and oftentimes uh, I sense that taking part in this new evangelization, in all these circumstances. For instance, there are people who work in factories, banks, garages, all sorts of things. You and I are not permitted to enter some of those places because of insurance. We have no business being there. We might be dangerous. The people who have the knowledge to do that work can be there and the people of faith at the mines, the factories, and so on, are the ones who are to be the evangelists and yeah. have an alertness. That's, see, that's one of the things. How alert are we to the other person and to their need to hear about Jesus Christ? That's part of our task, I think. Yeah, absolutely, uh, but you know, there is, a, there is a several possibilities for that. For instance, we are doing a, a, a new evangelization. Everybody who is watching us, and probably they didn't realize before, but now they, they know that we are, we are leaving a message. And this message is that our life is important in the moment in which you share your life, your experience of love, of mercy, of God, religious experience of God with, uh, with the other. It doesn't matter when, uh, in, in, in which place and so, but if you are baptized, just for this reason, you are an evangelizer. So for me, this is, is, is one of the most important matter that a new evangelization should have. Because, you know, we lose, we Christians, we lose the consciousness to be evangelizers. Mm -hmm. Because we, we, we don't understand anymore, and the indifference is the reason for that, mm -hmm. we don't understand anymore the necessity to share the experience to have encountered Christ. Yes. But once uh, you encountered Christ, you are no more the same. You change, you change. And the joy of this encounter is so big, so huge, is so deep that you need, you need to speak with someone else. You know, when, when you have a joy so great, what do you do? You cannot keep just for you. You cannot. You need immediately, you, you, you call someone, your friend, you call someone, you, you, you want to meet someone, and you want to say, well, this is my experience. We would like that the new evangelization should be the same. Listen, I, I met Jesus Christ in my life. And this is true, this is true. And the joy is so great that I want to share with you. This is 
to take in a serious way our baptism. This is to be serious and responsible as a Christian. And in some way, just, just this experience is the new evangelization. You know, I travel frequently and um, I wear my clerical shirt and any number of times that becomes an opportunity uh, true. for speaking and having some visible sign of our commitment. You know, of course, lay people won't wear clerical shirts, but they can wear a, a crucifix or some other sign of their love of Jesus and of their knowledge of His love of them, even more importantly, and be willing to speak not so much about how much I love God, but how much He loves me, as St. John and St. Paul correct themselves. Absolutely. I think that we need, we need really to give some small but very important signs. You know, this is also my experience. I travel a lot too in the airport by train, so everywhere. And the, I have the same experience and people, people want to speak with me yeah. and, and they, they, they are questioning and so, but I would say I am recogniz recognizable because I have my, my color, you know, and uh, they can recognize me as a priest. But uh, every Christian as the same, the same, should have the same experience. You spoke about the cross and uh, how beautiful it is for our uh, new generation to go and to have just a small sign, a cross. You can recognize that I am a Christian. And you know how, how beautiful it is for me traveling in the world and sometimes meeting people and they have a small sign of the cross, and they say, well, this is my brother, this is my sister, because uh, we share the same baptism. Yes. I will say, uh, you know, uh, I like to say that you are baptized, you have your name, because in the day in which you have born, you have a new name, and then you will be different from many others. In the day in which you are baptized, they put probably the same name, but you have a new name that is common for everybody that we are uh, uh, baptized. For everyone is the same. Christopher, Christopher, you are bringing Christ. That, that's what the word Christopher means, to bear Christ. Right. Uh, even something so simple. Uh, I was sitting in an airplane with a man who had uh, uh, something in his ears to listen to. He's doing work on his computer. He's going back to, to his book and generally avoiding eye contact with me. But at one point he sneezed and I said, God bless you. And he said, he looked at me and said, coming from you, that seems serious. Yeah. <laughs> That. And that was the start of a conversation. Sure. You know, just to say, God bless you. And I remind, well, it's professional. <laughs> and it, but it's, there's a sense of them being able to open a conversation. And it, it was something simple. Or saying a blessing before you eat food. To, right. you know, make the sign of the cross. Right. Don't worry about whether they like you or think you're cool. Are you giving glory to God for the food you have? Right. That's what's important. I agree. I agree. And then, you know, we need also to challenge people for that and thinking about mm -hmm. their own life. This is a responsibility for us. And small signs, probably they can recall to people their own identity and sometimes when they, what they learn as a children. Don't forget that the majority of our families, so and also in this country, the majority of, 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 of population is Christian, so are baptized, not necessarily Catholic. But you know, the relation with God, the relation with uh, the transcendent, the relation with something that uh, my mother and my father taught me 
as a children, and they forget during their life, and probably just the one sign of the cross before a meal, they will remember, ah, my mother taught me why I didn't, I did it with my, with my children. I had several experiences on this, uh, on yes. this point. Yes. And I think that uh, this is very important for us. And, you know, these, you know, it's, it's not exactly a, a huge program or a big organization called the New Evangelization, but it's these very concrete, personal efforts and signs and willingness to speak of Jesus Christ without shame or hesitation. That is very key. Absolutely. You know, the new evangelization can be summarized in one word, witness, witness. If you are witness, if you don't ashamed of your, of your faith, but you should be proud because uh, there is no, nothing, nothing bad, it's just love. And just to learn people to love in the right way, so why should I ashamed to be, to be Catholic or Christian or to be an unbeliever? I mean, we need, we need to give uh, with uh, a right consciousness uh, our witnesses. But I would say also, we should take in consideration what uh, the Apostle Peter wrote in his uh, first letter. Do this with uh, respect, with uh, sweetness, that means with uh, uh, capacity to understand that uh, you are giving the word of the Lord, and then with a right consciousness. Three uh, words that are very important as a method for the evangelization. So respect, sweetness, and right consciousness. And those attitudes of which St. Peter speaks in 1 Peter 3.15 are again focusing not on how I need to say something for myself, I'm focused on the need of the other person to know God, to know Jesus. Right. And, he, and, and as he says in the same verse, to give a reason for the hope that we have. Right. In a world that's indifferent because it has no hope, doesn't know what to look forward to. This is all they've got. We've got more and they need it. I agree, you know, and, and the apostles in this, in this uh, chapter 3, he continues, he says explicitly, be always ready yes. to give a reason for the hope uh, within you. Yes. I think that this is one of the main uh, content uh, for the new evangelization. Be always uh, 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 capable to give reason. Yeah be always ready to uh, give reason. Sort of an alertness. But you know, always be alert to what's going but on. But that means also for us the necessity to know our faith. That's not enough to share our experience, but uh, it is uh, really important to share our knowledge of the word of the Lord. And that means formation. That means that we need to know our faith. If I can say one word, well, you know, as a very important experience of new evangelization, we had the year of faith. The year of faith started in October 11, 2012, 50 years of the beginning of the, the Council of the Vatican II. And uh, he, 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 the finish was, the end was uh, the 24th of November uh, 2013. Well, during this beautiful experience of the year of faith, we suggest uh, to all the Christians, we suggest to do just uh, one simple thing. Learn to memory the creed, 
learn to memory the profession of faith and do every morning, every day, do of it your daily prayer. This was used to do, you know, until the 7th, 8th, 9th century. This was the daily prayer for, uh, for Christians. I don't know why we forget it and we say just uh, our profession of faith during Sunday Mass. But we should be able to go back to this old and beautiful tradition because if someone ask, asks uh, uh, about, of our faith, we should be able immediately to give reason of our hope and to say the content of our faith. And, and to see in the, the creed that these are those the core teachings that it would be better to be executed rather than deny any one of them. Absolutely. And if it's worth dying for, you can also then see it's worth living for and living out and sharing, you know, these truths that God's the creator and that Jesus came among us and died and rose for our salvation. Uh, the Holy Spirit has given us these, and the church and baptism, these, these are truths that... And Jesus continues, continues to stay with us. Exactly. That was not just uh, an historical event of uh, 20 centuries ago, mm -hmm. but he continues uh, to... So he, 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 he makes his company daily, daily with me. Well, this is, uh, you quoted early, uh, Matthew 28, and you know that that, and that go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Jesus concludes that, and know no. that I am with you until the end of the age. You know this is uh, a key element of His presence. It is beautiful, you know, because uh, uh, if we check uh, the first chapter of the Gospel, uh, Matthew and uh, he speaks about the Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. You will give to this child the name of Emmanuel, Jesus, Emmanuel, God with you. And at the end of his gospel, he repeated the same, the same idea, God is with you. Yeah. So I think that there is a beautiful expression I love a lot, a beautiful expression in the prophet, in the prophet Zacha, uh, Zacha, uh, Zachariah, Zechariah mm -hmm. is a small book, one of the, the last book of the Old Testament. And there is a beautiful expression. He said, and one day people will say to you, we want to stay with you, to reach you and stay with you because we heard that God is with you. So how beautiful is to share uh, with, uh, with people this experience so that people probably don't know us, but if we are witnesses of the presence of God among us, people would say, we want to stay with you because we can see that God is really with you. Yeah, there's that, that great line there that uh, 10 Gentiles will grab the, the sh uh, sleeve right. of every Jew and right. say, take us to meet God. This right. Put your sleeves out there. Get a big sleeve so people come and, and join you. It's beautiful, isn't it? it? It's, a, oh, it's, a, it's a wonderful, wonderful image that, that we have. You know, we are getting close to running out of time, unfortunately. Um, but I certainly do want to encourage uh, pastors and uh, lay people alike to get a hold of your book, The New Evangelization, Responding to the Challenge of Indifference, um, so that you can prepare yourself for this by going to ewtnreligiouscatalog.com or calling the number 1-800-854-6316 so that you can prepare yourself for it and. Um, to, to have this as a gift to help do this. 
Excellency, uh, we, we have pretty well run out of town. Would you please join me in blessing our audience? May Almighty God bless you and keep you and cause His face to shine upon you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And again, we can bring you guests uh, like Archbishop Fisichella and some of the other guests and all the other programs only because this network is brought to you by you. You make it possible. It belongs to you. So please keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill, and we'll be able to pay all the bills that we have too. God bless you and thank you.